everyone. This is the Breaking Smart Contract Workshop. Um, we have more people here, but I'm Cheyenne, Dean, John. We are part of Consensus Diligence. We do smart contract security and code auditing. If you have any security consultation or you want to work on DAPs, you are able to help. You can go to our website with audits and like no more. And also Mitex team, which is smart contract. Um, how would you explain that? Like, it's a security service as a service. Yeah, it's a tool you can run and see if your code has like the common mistakes or not. Um, so the agenda here is like we do this quick intro. We go through like a high level introduction to Ethereum, just to know we are in the same space. And we walk through some of the tools we have, the premix, some of the ones that you can start playing around with Ethereum, and. More details on how Ethereum works, how the memory works. We demo a few tools to make it easier for you to actually get through these challenges and also so some of those capture the flags or CPS. And we have a few challenges at the end that we try to hack together. We were hoping to have a two hour workshop with the desk and proper setups. So we're gonna just shrink everything in one hour and probably do more question and answer interactive and if we need to so, um, for the Ethereum background, I want to ask John you can talk about that. Which time should I take? Um, just for the comments. And, and um, so, like, where are, um, what, what, like, is the familiarity of the group here? Like, has everybody written a smart contract at some point, more or less? Um, do you feel like you understand, like, you understand what the state looks like and, um, like logs and opcodes and things like that. Okay, I'll go super fast. It'll take five minutes. Great. Um, but it's good to review, and somebody probably didn't want to admit that they don't know all these things. Um, uh, so, okay, so Ethereum. What is Ethereum? Ethereum is like this. all the, these accounts. Uh, they have these four properties. Every single account has a known, a balance, a uh, code, maybe, you know, a caveat, and uh, maybe storage. Um, so the state is made up of this great big list of accounts. There are contract accounts and external accounts. External accounts don't have code, don't have storage. Um, there's opcodes, they do things in the VM. Um, there you go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 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 it didn't seem like that. Let's go next. Okay. Okay. Yeah, talk about these. Um, yeah, so this, this, this is useful to, to be reminded of, even if you're familiar with this stuff in the context of like security, um, that there are these, these two types of transactions. You can just send money or send the key from one externally owned account, EOA, to another. Um, or you can send to a contract. And the magic happens when you send the ETH to a contract, send this transaction. The contract can do like any other sort of internal transactions. Um, message calls, it's sometimes called. Um, this creates a state transition. Uh, contracts can call each other, and and this is like it, it gets worse, right? Like I heard recently that we're at like there are you know uh, the, the average call depth on on the main net is like at like getting deeper all the time, and contracts are more because of, like increasing composability. At some point we stopped saying interoperability. Eve 2.0 took interop away, and now we say composability. Um, I just figured that out, but but so so this composability is uh, creating uh, a lot more complexity. Uh, things are happening a lot more deeply in the call stack, um, and, and that may have interesting implications. I haven't thought a lot about. Can everybody hear me at the back, or do I need to project more? Okay. Uh, gas. I'm. There's gas. I think you all know there's gas. Um, but block gas limit, that's really important. Actually, gas is, who uh, here subscribes to my newsletter? Morellian's Smart Contract Security Newsletter, right? So I can't stop talking about, like I want to do a newsletter that's not about gas, um, but it's the most interesting thing to me really right now. Um, so the block gas limit, that can get you in a lot of trouble if you run out of all the possible gas that any miner will ever give you. Um, and then, if your opcodes just change in price and you were counting on them not doing that, sorry. Um, 
There's a table of opcodes with gas prices. Uh, I, I made these slides, so. Some <laughs> <laughs> things have blocks. That's a wow, lot. Lots of change. Yeah, there are, there are a few things there that one was like for the gas price. Yeah. So if you increase gas price even by one way, miners would mine that if, uh, and prioritize that over the other one. So you can front run or get ahead of like, the other transaction by just increasing the gas price by one way. Or the fact that the like, block size, the limit is like, because blocks are limited or scarce. So you can do some like crypto economics plays or like some attacks based on that. It was just overall those kind of things. Front running is, if you want to talk front running, go deep on that, talk to Cheyenne. He's been some really interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of tomorrow at four about that uh, overall front running taxonomy. So, so I can't take over time. All right. <laughs> So as I said, this was supposed to be a more hands-on workshop, but you're gonna be, I'm gonna be hands-on, and you can also follow if you are interested. So, um, just got up. Yeah, you can go to this link. There is also on the whiteboard. Um, and if you go to this link, I'm just gonna open this. And make it bigger. So you're going to see uh, this gist here, which is a bunch of challenges. Uh, you can click on challenge one. Actually, before doing that, click on challenge one. You can see a challenge here. Like the, if these are not challenges, I just want to like make sure we are on the same level. Uh, before that one, you can do. Okay. Just to know exactly that again, we are on the same level. Like this is solidity. I guess everyone here is familiar with solidity source code, but it doesn't do anything special here. It just have a variable name, owner, and it just when you say hi, it mentions and it puts the name in the name and emits um, a hi name. So um, nothing really special here. So there is a few things I want you to know. One is like um, about this slide that. Um, Things are public. Is that if you go to um, Robsten, which is uh, Ethereum scan Robsten, which um, you can see every information on blockchain um, and what is happening. So let's say if you want to store a value. Um, so um, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Going to again here. So if you want to store a value on uh, blockchain, don't ever store secrets or anything. You want to know that, but you might not know how that works and what that means. So a lot of times in uh, smart contracts, the memory starts at here, so it's called slot zero. So what, how you can see that? You can actually see the where the memory is stored. So you can actually go here and with an UTFA and see the memory, the, the thing that constructor will use. So you can actually read the text that was passed to the contract through these data. It's, they have gibberish too, but there is this data here too. So I'm working on this other tool uh, called Legions for now. My chance is really beta. <coughs> I'll send a link on Twitter later on. But this is something to be able to like easily poke around nodes and smart contracts. So like in this case, I just want to show you like what I mean by this. So let's say this smart this smart contract. I just copy the address um, and okay. so I run this tool. So this tool has like nice interface. You can do tells gives you like all the information that there is. So in this case, we, what we need is to connect to a node, which is now I use Robsten um, in Vero just to. You can use your own node or connect to any node. By default, it's connected to mainnet. Here, it connects, uh, it connects to testnet to just be able to like query things. So it gives you a bunch of options. Like, um, so this tool you can check it out later. It's not important here. I just want to show you how you read storage. Like in this case, I want to read. Like when you do query, you can read the balance, the details of a block, code of a smart contract do some cryptography things and even read storage. So in this case, I want to read the storage on this address that I just copied. So imagine that you have a secret in that uh, smart contract. So when I click, it goes query the first 10 um, storage there. So this is what 
smart contracts of uh, UVMCs, but this tool also tries to like cast that to stream. So it reads the first 10 storage, and you can see that even though that storage should not be visible from outside, I mean, based on traditional software development, it is. So we can read hello there from here. There are other tools here you can uh, use. This tool, as I said, is not part of this workshop necessarily, but go around play it. If you want to add function to it, functionality to it, it's like perfect. And as I said, like, I really like this whole interface of like, the command line and nice and consistent. So, getting back to where we were, yeah, if you go to this link, that, um, that link, kick.to, um, you're going to have to go through a bunch of challenges. Uh, one is this challenge, uh, one that if you look, it's really simple. It has a balance. When you look, open the balance, it has like 10 you can buy. Uh, and whatever you pass on, it adds to your balance. And you can burn and whatever that you have. And specify it's going to burn. Do you see any way to have an uh, infinite balance here? Okay, can see? Or it, it will underflow. Yeah, exactly. Uh, do you want your trip to close now? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to like showcase the tool? Want to one, one. They showcase how easier it is. Yeah, uh, next year. There, there is like, there, so you basically did how a code auditor finds a spot. Like go through the code, find what that is. There are some tools like Mythics that you mentioned. That uh, makes it easier to actually find these uh, common bugs. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Challenge one. Uh, so yeah, people here use Remix. Anyone? Remix? Remix. Remix is great. Uh, so one of the great things that we've been working on lately is this uh, MythX platform, which is a security as a service tool that like. You throw smart contracts at it, and then it throws back a bunch of bugs at you. So in general, like, it's pretty great. Another awesome thing is it's built right into Remix. So if you go to the plugins thing, type NFX, it goes up, you hit that activate button. And as it turns out, if you uh, load in challenge one while well, you hit the, the Remix thing, and you hit the analyze button, it actually to do by both of them. You can actually run it <laughs> The screenshot is already set up. It's all on the right track. Anyway, uh, so yeah. Uh, so you see, you hit the analyze button, and it spits out the issues on the bottom. You click on the issues, and then it actually goes to the line of code. That's the thing. So super convenient, super neat, uh, good way to check on workshops. So, yeah, very cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, if you create an account on Mythex.io, you'll have like persistent uh, results. If you if you just do the scan with Remix, it uh, it does it with kind of like a sample address, and it goes away and you can refresh. Um, but if you create your own account, you can set up the account with your credentials, and that's kind of nice. Uh, also, if you want to pay money, it's a premium service, so like you don't have to pay money, but if you do pay money, you get much deeper scans. Like if you have large contracts that will actually spend a long time on like symbolic execution depositing, and like uh, it goes a lot deeper and for like other bugs, it's great. So do that, pay us money. Uh, there's also these command line tools, which are great. Uh, Saber MythX, if you, if you like JavaScript stuff, uh, MythX CLI, if you like Python stuff. Um, they both have like the Truffle integration, that's pretty good. It's other, other goodness. Yeah. So this is mainly for the more hands on one, but if you guys need drops and test nets or anything, can either go to faucet.metamask.io or ping me, I have like a bunch of my phone, I can just send it to you right now. Um, just to like finish what uh, Dean was saying, so here, like let's say for this challenge, Mythix is here. Like when you install it to uh, plugins, so Mythix is here. You can just press analyze, and it actually looks for you and finds all the issues. So here, it says that you can overflow, even though like if you're looking at that, you're passing message as value, so that means someone can should send that much money to overflow, which is less real estate. But this one is the amount that is user input, so you can easily underflow, as you said, and uh, un do, do that. So pass the ball. Yeah, there we go. But you're getting three of them. 
He's a, he's a juggling ball. Not <laughs> you can't use that hack attack. I'm documenting his page. All right, so we, we touched on these, but um, so if ga gas runs out for any reason, your function calls reverse, and the whole state change doesn't happen anymore. Uh, there are fallback functions that will be invoked if you just um, don't mention any function names, or you mention a function name that doesn't exist. So that, um, that has been there for some of the attacks that like um, the transaction does not exist and it runs a fallback function. And so the documentation is the best way to look at. And we're going to introduce some other ones too. So um, this is where I ran, like I jumped ahead myself. So I want to talk about the warehouse storage is stored, and I already talked about this legend, which this is a link if you want to download and look at. I already showed them to you. But there is also this blog post from one of our colleagues. If you just, the link was long, so this is the best way to find it. If you Google um, understanding Ethereum smart contract storage and click on this program, the blockchain.com, this is a good blog. It goes around the different patterns, how to implement like arrays, how to implement different things. Um, and if you have any questions there, just hit, hit us up at the diligence team. You can, um, the author works there. So. So the other challenge, we just talked about like how to store, um, how not to store secrets right there on the smart contract. I'm just gonna stand up so it's much easier. Um, so in the traditional way, the best way to store smart is store passwords is to hash it, right? So you can hash a password in Solid PDF's cache, so you can just hash, uh, save the cache and uh, use that. So this seems like a good way, right? If anyone looks at the variable, they still cannot guess what the password is. But it really depends on um, how you store that. So everything on Ethereum is deterministic and public. So in this case, so in this case, if you go on challenge two, is it big enough? Do you guys see? So yeah, this is simple. Like for people that have done so, you know, this might be too simple. But um, so this is just a construct that gets, gets the password, saves the password, and later on you can get the password and get the money out from there. So in this case, like you might say that like, anyone sending a guest password transaction, they, you can see the password and run it. But even before that. We can just add the same way as we were doing before, uh, go to Rob's and, um, and just see the password there. Like that's as easy as it gets. Like So the constructor, you can go there and I feel like this is a transaction we did for another conference. Yes, this is for Nordsec. But like you can see the con contract there. So it's the easiest way. You can even still do tools and read, read some other ways. Um, all right, so the other thing that a lot of people get uh, confused about that is the entropy of randomness. So do you, can you, have, can you get some applications that you might need that randomness for? It's like games or, or yeah, gambling, not serious. So it's a lot of use and promotion of blockchain has been on these kind of applications too. Uh, we don't see this that much these days. Like, uh, like so you can very really get randomness. Because early on people start to use different aspects, even timestamp for the randomness. But all those can, people can guess or can, they can just enumerate on them. So they, they were like, all right, let's try to use some other things that are not known from before, like the block hash or uh, like hash the block hash or like some other variation of that. So let's see if that works or not. So we have this other uh, challenge, challenge three, which um, basically is this one. It's a lottery. It has one Ethereum in there. Um, so you have to pass a number and put some value in there because you have to pay for your lottery ticket. And this part, 
it is using the hash of the last block, and you hash that, and it turns to a number, and if your guess is the same as the number, it transfers you this much value. So this seems to be like a random, like you wouldn't know, but how would you um, guess this, or how would you win this lottery? I would write a small contract that does this calculation and then calls a lottery function with the right number. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <balls>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here for the balls. So. <laughs> <laughs> so one great point here is like, in order to attack this contract, you have to write a contract, deploy a contract, <coughs> and use that contract to attack this contract. So you, you go to the same, you run your code in the same environment that this code is running at the same time. So um, here, in order to attack this, you have to write. Yeah. Well, yeah. Good question. Do we actually have to write a separate smart contract? Since this is looking at the previous block, you could just look if that wins the lottery and then send the transaction with a high way and basically get it into the next block. That's possible. You're trying to risking because there's a 15 second block. So if you miss that block. You miss that money. You have to send another transaction. Oh, that makes sense. Uh, you, you can try to get in, but it's a race. Uh, but there's yeah. a short chance. This, this is much more elegant and easy to pull off. Yeah, like um, there has been some other lotteries like that, and uh, we've seen attacks that people send like a thousand transactions just to make sure they get in. But that means for if you miss one one block, you get all those. Like, I don't know if you looked at the Coinbase of the current block, you'd have to brute force this. But since it's in the previous block, there's both ways. Yeah, but that's a race. Yeah, yeah. That's Can you know the coin? No, no, you can't know the block, the hash of the current block. Yeah, there's no hash of the current block. It's specified at runtime. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's why it's using the previous block. So uh, let let's say let's attack this together here. So. I'm cheating, I have the commented code here, just to just say copy this. So um, what what do you what you do is um, So one thing is that you don't need to full, have a full function here. You can just have the interface, but this is easier for now for us. And um, as I said, this was supposed to be something you solve, but I just solved it here. Um, so what you do, what you have to do is I'm gonna have one extra. So now, in this case, uh, what I need to do is I already deployed this before, and <coughs> so we can check this transaction. There's this much ether. So what I've got to do is just deploy this transaction. So it deploys a uh, contract. So um, I think I know why this was. This doesn't have a function. One trick is to change this to constructor. So you don't have to deploy and call the function again. So in this case, you have to deploy this con this contract call attack with, with the input of the target, which is the target's address. And you have to pass some value in there. So what it does is it, tar it calls the target lottery function, which is this function, with uh, some value, which is the message dot value. This value is how much money it is att attached to that. And with the, uh, with the number that this contract is calculating here as well. So if the number is the same, it sends out one easy way to make it more ethically good hack is self-destruct self so you would get the money back and 
clear the blockchain. So here we um, just compiled. We use the injected FT. So we're using MetaMask here, just making sure I'm not attacking on mainnet. Okay. Um, go. Construct not in for in the name for the right part. Didn't construct the keyword command before. Yeah. What's that? Construct the keyword command in five, not four. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like There is this error, so it says in line on the board. Free juggling balls, do you ever Address we deploy on the time that we're going to fail, but the time. Better, maybe this is a better way to see it. So in terms of transaction, you can see, um, yeah, it's it sent one way, got this much ether, send it back to the message just sender and self-destruct. All right. So the, one of the main points of this was um, to say that you can attack a contract with a, another contract just to get to the same environment, attack it using the same. Code, um, same environment, same variables, everything that that other contract has access to. Um, is there any questions or comments about this? The debugging was fine. Yeah. All right, so this is like similar example, but um, like in the sense that like you need a contract to attack another contract. 
But it goes back to the DAO story, and I hope everyone here knows about DAO and know what we learned about DAO from DAO. Um, that smart contracts are hard, just don't put that much money on them. But, uh, so the DAO is Film Classic. Um, do you know the relation between Film Classic and DAO? It started from there. And we had to say attack. So, the relationship attack patterns. Um, I'm going slower here because I think I'm going so fast. Uh, but what's the other two? Yeah, am I going too fast? No. Okay, fine. Is it too slow? Is it too slow? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you might need more challenges. Uh, so yeah, so the DAO attack the menu was like the two lines of code that should have been replaced the other way around. Um, so here you can see that the value. Um, so someone can call withdraw, it checks if the balance is fine, it sends the value to the caller, it reduces the balance of the um, balance of the caller by that value, and um, th this was the pattern. So this was something was wrong here. And what was wrong was that here the attacker can have a contract that is the basically the balance holder. And the balance holder can call withdraw. Um, so this is the fallback function that we're saying. Function basically calls this uh, this uh, withdraw again. So how the attack works is the attacker calls this attack function, which calls um, the victim's function, which is a DAO, to withdraw one day or one unit of token. Then um, checks the balance sees the balance and it calls and sends one, one way or one token to the attacker. And the attacker, as we said, the fallback function just gets executed when there's no other function assigned to that. So it calls this uh, table, it runs the door again, and this goes on back and forth and it drains the contract. So would you say this uh, attack, this, this code would work for this kind of attack? Why is that? Because it's, there's no stop condition. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, exactly. So, you, you run out of gas here. So, if you can just do it, okay. it loops. That was good. You can just do it, and it loops here. Like, um, it goes out of like, it runs out of gas. Yeah, maybe you repeat the stack numbers. Yeah, exactly. Like, then you can really run something like that. So there are a few checks you can do here. One is uh, there's this opcode called gas left. You can check how much gas is left, but you have to do a little math there to see if I should do another call or not. There's another way to say if the balance of the, like if this balance here, um, that? if this balance is like how much is left here, check that. You have to have an exit condition there because you can't really run it forever, that like it doesn't it stop. And if it runs out of gas, as you said, you revert. So you lose all the balances that you try to hack in there. So as you said, at the end, $180 million or something like that were stolen because these two lines should have been the other way around. That's what makes like security and smart contract really hard, because it seems fine, but it should be at the other way around. And there's a pattern that says check effects and um, interaction. So we can check, check and do the effect and then do the interaction. So it should be the other way around. So for this, we're going to try to do a reinterest attack and steal money from this charity. It's just for education. <laughs> so, yeah, let's show you that. So the contract we have here is pretty simple. Um, yeah, the mapping that this is a really common pattern in other token contracts and other contracts. So we have this uh, area of balance, like mapping of balances that holds the balances. There's an event that doesn't really matter. Um, constructor, so it requires one to have one ether in there, and it adds that one ether to the message just center sender balance. So anyone can uh, donate. It's payable, like anyone can donate to their own balance. They donate to the charity, they get the balance. You can check your balance, and you can withdraw. 
as you can see, it's using the same pattern as um, the same pattern as the DAO. So it checks the balance, it sends that out, and if it succeeds, this is like a new output that was added. Um, so if I, it just um, emits, a, emits a, an event and reduces the deducts the balance. So you want to attack this. Um, I want to make, make it more interactive as, as possible, but I don't know exactly how not to show you the solution. Yet. Uh, so the best way like, to do this, like, let's try to write it together. Uh, or, or let's try this. Um, how would you, what would be the stop condition here if you want to like, do a withdraw attack? How would you try to, like, what stops you from like, doing this loop of like, draining a contract? The total balance of the contract is smaller than my balance on the contract. So you want to get more than half of the balance? No, uh, if, if nothing is left, if, if my call will fail because it runs out of balance, then I stop before that balance. I mean, if your balance, so you're just, so you're just studying your balance. Right? Yes, if the balance in my in the mapping uh, on my address is uh, bigger than the total balance of the contract. Yeah, so we that. It just means like if he has one and the total balance is 100, or, or say he has like 0.5, he doesn't want to try and withdraw one. Okay, no, if he died, it would, it would actually catch that. Anyhow. I'm just going to like code here and check again. So this is like basically equivalent of like using stack overflow to where you're actually making things more. Just copy the code and then try to make it work. It always works. Yeah, exactly. So here, exactly the um, the attack here. We are using the constructor because it's easier here to do. But then you can call attacks. So here you have to like donate first. You have to have a balance in that charity to be able to attack. Because if not, when you call it balance withdraw, it checks if you have a balance in there or not. So the first step is to do that fact. So in constructor, we pass the target address, uh, which is the challenge. Which we need to have that in the same place. And then we donate the message that value that passed to this um, deployment. Um, and then later after that, we have to call this attack. So I'm going to just deploy it and then run, uh, walk through that with you. Sends whatever we send this to um, <coughs> to the charity and I think I'll come back. so as you can see it created this uh, contract and it sent ten way to our charity so it, we in here we should uh, see that we have the balance for that contract if you want to check you, there's also like this easy way to check. It's easy way to check a lot of things here. You can um, use uh, challenge for which is the chari charity. First, at the address you have to deploy it, and you can just get access to yes. yeah. access to the functionality that there is. So 
now you can check the balance of the, um, the smart contract, which is the smart contract. You can check the balance, and it is 10. As you said, 10 way, and we are 10. Does the index tool plugin check this? Um, you'll see. Does the index can find the It should. Yeah, let's sure. attack this, and then we can experiment with them. Uh, so if we go back to the structure. So here, if you look at the code, um, yeah. it's the same pattern as we talked about. So if you call attack, attack is going to call withdraw with the total balance of that address. And it's going to send the fallback. It's going to get the fallback. I mean, the withdrawal is going to call the fallback. And if address does, that the target is more than one ether, you would try again. So I guess I have to send someone to that address first. <laughs> yeah, it's already not more than one ether. I'm just going to send one ether to this address to make sure our So let's try this, because um, at the end we're going to try matrix to see if it can find this. So there is no input because we already passed the constructor the target. We just call attack. One day. Like, I guess you got the whole point. Like, I'm not sure we're going to have to debug this now, but you can see that if, if, the, if the attack is successful, it should run something like um, this. sent out um, and they internally try to send I really confuse myself here. Yeah. Let's try to do something cooler. Let's try me things here. Sorry, actually we check both conditions of the the left gas and the balance. Yeah, so here, like, there's an arbitrary check. It just checks uh, that uh, the target balance has like more than one in there. And the problem here are, um, is our path sends to less of the money, so it has to run like multiple transactions. So if I send like 0 0.1 ether, it's going to be much easier to like attack it right now. Um, no, but in general, it's on the safe side, because uh, we can um, revert. To, to different yes. Yeah. We should, okay, we both yeah. So if you want to do that, then you can do like this check. Can do give. Uh, I think gas. Yeah, gas. Left is like less than. I think can do 2300, 2300 for a transfer. And if it's that gas left, then um, like just return. Like don't continue with that. So something like this could work also as well. 
Uh, but one thing I'm excited to do is to see how Mithex would find us um, and, and just run it on the original one. So this is the, tra the, trans the contract that is vulnerable, so we can run Mithex here, challenge for, analyze. Are you, are, you, are you logged in as a user? <coughs> yes. Yeah. I think I better email that my beta is done. We'll see. We'll, we'll get you in. We'll get you an account. Yeah. I should have an So it can take up two minutes. Two minutes. Um, and start juggling. <laughs> Uh, I learned this trick from Rain. No, it's not a juggling trick. I'm just pulling them because I get really like biting. Um, uh, let's like to be. What what questions do people have about security? What anxieties do people have about like writing smart contracts? Um, you know, we're like for for security experts. What could you really like get out of this in a few minutes if you could ask us some questions? Does anybody have you like deployed a contract to the mainnet? Yeah, like Rumble, whatever the hell. Yeah. How did that feel? Deploying it. Scary as hell, right? Just quite honestly, I, I, uh, I had my GUI, I had my gas set, to my gas <coughs> set to DevNet. So it was super fast. It took like three seconds or something. And it cost me $200. <laughs> right, but that was that two hundred dollars to like minimize the time that you. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah the contract went super. Yeah. It was like better than yeah. that. Yeah. And this is this is uh, your Chris from Maker, is that correct? Yeah, Chris and Chris? Yeah. yeah, this is a personal time. First time I. Ever yeah. I had fun blowing. Personally, I never deployed anything of consequence to the mainnet, like my stuff. Um, but I don't. I've never like deployed anything that like matters a lot. So I, and I, I'm okay with that. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. I deployed those with MySQL wallet. Yeah. Oh, um, actually, yeah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, dating yourself. Yeah, I know that if uh, I try to use the protocol with computer, but not working at yeah. the end. Yeah. And then uh, I use the half an ether. Sorry, half a what? Half, half an ether. Uh, half an ether to, yes. to, to pay for it. Yes, and I use the same as a remix, and the, it's uh, 0.01. Huh. Yes. Gas calculation or information yes. is hard. Yes. Has anybody ever like uh, had a contract hacked mm -hmm. on you, or like lost money in some, you know, in the many ways that you can lose money in this world that you're comfortable <laughs> sharing? I have. <laughs> I have to. Really? <laughs> Nobody? This is fine. Okay. So, John, yeah. talking about the point of main now, when do you know you're ready? Uh, once we've audited your company. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, uh, so I would say after clicking, like, deploy, you know, that's yeah. <laughs> I, I, No, I don't know. I think, like, you... Uh, have done all you can, right? There's a point of diminishing return when, like, there's just no other, like, you know how, like, you write blog posts and, like, you read it and you read it and you can't do anything. You can't even see your own typos. So then you get somebody else to do it. That's us. You, you, you're prepared. You're, like, well prepared. Um, I have a blog post about preparing for a smart contract audit. I'll uh, tweet that right away. Um, but, yeah, so, like, there's a lot of things you can do to not get a very good result from an audit by just like dropping some code with no documentation on us. Uh, or you can like do, do your work internally up front to be really ready for it. Um, come to us like well in advance. Maybe, maybe we decide that the best thing to do is to like work with you for a few days just to like give you like, hey, like fix this, fix this, delete this. Uh, and then like you'll get a better audit because like we'll you know, be able to focus just on like going deeper. Um, and I, I think that's like, that's uh, like the being well prepared for an audit can make like an audit more affordable and effective for most people. And, um, and I think like most 
even smaller teams that like aren't maker can afford to like write documentation if they're willing to take the time to do it. And usually if you write good documentation or specs for your code, like you sure you just hacked out the code. Uh, maybe you uh, wrote tests first, in which case you're like doing great way ahead of the curve. Uh, but then if you like sit and you're like try to communicate in prose, like just plain English to someone else what your code does, you have to read it. And I guarantee you'll find like something you'll like be like, well wait, does it actually do that thing when this happens? And you'll read it again, you'll be like, oh no, it actually does something I did not think it does. So that's, that's a great that's way to find bugs. Yeah. Highly recommended, yeah. In, in line with that, like, uh, writing in line com comments and documentation and one overall what this app should do is similar to that. Then when you want to explain, you can see the line of code and the comment is like, is it what I'm saying they should do? Like that, that helps a lot. Like you don't need to be graphs and charts that explain that. Uh, Bernard, do you want to talk about oh, yeah. something? Yeah. So there are actual results. <laughs> Actually, you have to be pro to see this. So we have a free and a pro version, uh, and the entrance is actually limited to the premium version. So <laughs> I'm going to show you that on my machine. So basically, the result you get is uh, these two things, and they are both relevant for the attack. So whenever you make a low-level call, like here to another contract, <coughs> then uh, the EVM gets all the gas that is still left to execute the other complex code. And if you do that, then uh, and then you should never change the world state after you did it. Because if the contract is untrusted, then this change might never happen because the other contract can re-handle that contract, right? So that's the thing we want about this mythex. And if you move this line um, up here, up, uh, up over the call, then the issue is fixed. Because then the balance will be detected the first time already, and it won't matter if you react. That's that check <coughs> next interaction. Right. And um, one thing I just wanted to show, do you have the chat on the so as it's linked, there's a readme file, if I'm not going to show the last slide again, but there's this, uh, there's this best, um, best practices, the best practices that uh, it's, a, like it's open source, there's a lot of contribution has been done, and that, uh, please read that, there's a lot of good things there, and if you see any mistakes, just tell us, or fix that there. This is captured on Ether, that some of the challenges were based on that, you can just play around, and do CTF style things. Um, and hack contracts, it's really fun. This is how you can find us on Twitter. And also, if you're interested in auditing, either as a client, either reading the audit reports, you can find all our blog posts, audit reports, that they are now public, all there. It's really interesting to see the bugs that were found, how they were fixed, and they're all there. And um, I guess we have like two minutes ish left. So. Thank you for being here on stickers and um, juggling balls out back there. And thanks. Well, thanks.